We will attempt to get started. <laughs> I mean, you guys are all spread out all over the room. Feel free to come in. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty informal for this. We talked about it earlier, and we thought it might actually be good to start with maybe some feedback from for those of you who have been in the previous session or some questions. This the, the title of this session is kind of stories from the trenches, what to do, what not to do, stories about regulatory compliance, implementation, technology, open source, whatever you guys want to talk about, really. We started talking about it as preparation and we couldn't shut up, so <laughs> we're going to try not to do that before we hear from you guys. So I just kind of, if you guys want to say anything to open the floor, maybe there's some comments or questions that you guys would like us to cover first. Hey, Leo, do you want to start um, with your use case? That might be, it, that might spark some conversation. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, let me briefly introduce myself. So I was... I was not in the session that uh, you guys held uh, earlier. Um, I've only been invited as the <laughs> diversity token, as, <laughs> as you can see, uh, which is great, means society is, is uh, improving. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I'm the CEO, founder of uh, Regnosis. Uh, we are a regulatory technology or reg tech uh, company. Uh, what we provide is a low-code uh, collaborative platform for uh, regulatory reporting. So in a nutshell, you have all those financial institutions that have to comply uh, with the same rules by the same deadline, and they're all rushing to their implementation. So what we provide is just a way for them to uh, work together to achieve that goal if all of them uh, just um, uh, do a part of the interpretation and code it into a functional language, and they can all share the output. Um, and as part of this journey, we are um, actually in the process of contributing a core part of our, of our platform uh, to Finos. So that's one of the reasons we are, uh, we are here today. Uh, but as part of what we've been, uh, what we've been doing recently, um, we uh, are working on a production implementation of a, a new reporting regime that's uh, coming live in the US. So all firms uh, operating in the US market will have to comply by the end of the year. Uh, and it's effectively the new US CFTC regime. Uh, so as part of that, we have like many firms, uh, many financial institutions uh, using our platform, collaborating on our, on our platform to effectively uh, divvy up the work of interpreting the rules. Um, and as part of that journey, we've, we've also had a number of interaction with uh, regulators um, as you know under the auspices of you know can us as regulators deliver rules as code or machine executable regulation however you want to to call it um, but if it's like taking interest in in, uh, in what we have done so far so that's in a nutshell why i'm here <laughs> I'm, I'm going to channel Francesca for a second, which was, I will not even attempt a British accent, um, which was to start with maybe what feels painful in that process. Um, we could also start with defining the outcomes or the problems maybe that you set out to solve originally. But from a regulator perspective, former regulator, I just clarify, um, I think some of the pain points are maybe felt equally on both sides of that border, which is a lack of resources to get the state of the regulatory system in a position to be able to accommodate that type of modernization. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, and the level of effort that's needed to get there is not necessarily worth uh, the result yet at least from a US perspective, potentially. Um, and there's still this kind of lingering question of who is pushing or pulling the data? And then what implications does that have if you are, what did we say earlier, starting off from a um, pushing perspective? Yes. So those are some challenges. I'm just going to throw that out there and see if that ignites any comments or thoughts, or we can go in a completely different direction. Unless, Anna, you want to I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Jump in. Yeah. Phil? <laughs> Don't be afraid. Um, so, I'm Phil. I work with GitHub and work with a lot of financial institutions that either want to open source software as their, you know, uh, their developers participate in or have completely locked it down. Different interpretations of what 
those regulations mean and how they can or can't enable their development team to contribute back to projects, whether it be something like FTC3 as a spin out or another open source project so far. What can be done from a, a regulatory perspective to kind of unify or, or kind of codify the expectations that a regulator would have of, uh, of a bank to allow that sort of participation? One some misunderstanding, what can be done to kind of unify that and, and set an even set of expectations? Well, I know, I know, but I've developed regulatory policy for 10 years, so I can't avoid um, getting in, involved in it. And I mean, this is where, because obviously the Gates Foundation are interested in um, markets where there really aren't particularly in um, digital financial services where the markets are still so new, there's really not a ton of regulations. And actually, um, a lot of them are, um, I wouldn't say they're model regulations, but very similar movements have been made because the business model, i.e. Uh, mobile money, is quite similar in terms of, so So we have we have great opportunity in, in flushing this stuff out um, at an early stage for these markets where, um, if you are um, if you aren't clear on outcomes or expectations, then this could create like a new cost for industry, which is one that could be much e um, much more easily solved through technology rather than kind of individuals. But you know, I'm a conduct regulator for for years. That's what I did, um, and I know you're working in, in areas where um, the quant side of it is much more prevalent in terms of outcomes and can be easier for reg tech. But I think for me, what we need to understand from the community is 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 the, the issues that could make it easier or less easy for them to do. So there is definitely a feedback loop that needs to be established where regulators can understand that. Now, what regulators will tell you is, um, there's this term kind of regulatory uncertainty. Um, which was one of the reasons we set up the Innovation Hub in the UK, right? Because we wanted to try and cut through that and make it easier for new entrants that we thought were doing something that could benefit the industry to get the message direct from the regulator. You know, you don't need to do this or you do need to do that. Um, but it, it demonstrates that there's a lot of intermediate activity and particularly in markets where compliance departments have grown significantly since the financial crisis of layering on top um, and some of that's about the regulator, some of it that's about the regulation, some of that's about the relationship between the regulator and their supervisor and conversation. So not all of this is, um, is, written, is, is even written down mm -hmm. and certainly isn't all written down. In the, so I think the sources for the behaviour aren't simply from rules and regulations. Speeches, for example, that would always be cited as a, oh, well, we saw this speech from... This CEO, so we thought we'll go down this. I mean, the greatest example I ever heard from a CEO was around um, behavioural biases. There was a big piece of work, I don't know if you remember, around um, economists in regulation thinking about, um, hey, look, you know, maybe our regulations are based on like disclosure and transparency, and we're assuming too much that individuals base their financial decisions on rational decision making, i.e. if you give them the right information, they'll do the right thing. But you know what, There's there are other reasons why people do things and maybe the industry could be exploiting some of these biases and this could be what's creating the problems. We didn't really ever at the FCA create rules out of it, but we put out quite a lot of opinion pieces. A CEO told us that he had basically stopped certain products because he could, you know, he was like, I can see down the line they're going to go down this route and we're going to create rules internally. Um, so, it, you know, for me, there needs to be a feedback loop. We need to understand where that uncertainty might be. Um, for me, algorithmic underwriting is a really critical space where we need to actually have a really good conversation about that because actually even 
normal credit products based on normal um, credit reference bureau uh, processes are being interpreted differently by different companies for different products. So it's not just the regulations that guide behaviour, there are all sorts of other things that, that guide it, but I think understanding from the tech community and the open source community where those differences lie and why it's causing problems and where that might be creating cost or inefficiency is a loop that I think needs to be established from my perspective. Yeah. Yeah, you go. Um, now, what, what I wanted to, to add to that is, and that's kind of doing a plug uh, for open source in general, um, but um, I think it needs just more safe spaces between the regulators and the regulated entities to exchange on, on those topics. And uh, on some of them, Finos and generally like, you know, open source is a great way uh, to create a, a forum where those concepts, ideas can, can be put on the table, where a better understanding of the practices, like in, on the example you mentioned, a greater understanding of the practices, you know, in the trenches of how people do things may alleviate uh, regulators' concern about how, you know, you need to retain those for 10 years or, or whatever. Just having that understanding and then would create um, effectively, a, 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 you know, an easier path uh, for for complying and maybe not having a requirement at all. So I think this is definitely a part where you know Finos I think has a has a big role to play in being one of those venues in which the regulated entities and the uh, regulators uh, can can convene and exchange and uh, um, without any adversarial adversarial approach. So I have bad news in the US, right? Um, the retention, the data retention policies will vary by agency. They go off of the federal models, of course, recommended by the executive agencies, at least financial regulators. Um, so that might be as part of some of the whack-a-mole if you're trying to engage with US financial regulators. What I found when I worked within the system that was really valuable is if there are other agencies who have models where they are already operating in an open source way, and there are, they will have data retention policies around their open source activities, and that is something that is open and available and could be shared with an agency that perhaps you have a really great executive sponsor internally that's willing to kind of help do that work and that culture, provide that, that kind of change leadership that's needed helping connect them with those models um, or the people in the other agencies that sponsor the open source work is a really great starting point and it will accelerate the conversation. It just de-risks it, right? Because, oh, well, so-and-so is doing it. So um, they've, that they've gone through a thoughtful process. We trust their analysis, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe I'm thinking also, Finos, this is a great space or I don't know how interested the Gates Foundation, but if there was even just a correlated place where, where where are the agencies globally that are participating in open source activity and how do they manage that from a data retention and policy perspective would be really valuable. Those are templates for people to go to. Yeah, and I think I think templates is a, it's a good way of putting it. I mean, we we kind of tried to do similar things, for example, in the OSPO space. So I think in the open source program office, <clears throat> some of what you're saying actually is not, it's a regulation that re, um, refers back to that rather than let's say financial regulations specifically, but data retention is one of them. And, and what we see are people coming together from different institutions and saying, oh, we do this, or how do you do that? And how do you weave in this other jurisdictional thing on top of it? Because you have multinationals and that's the other trick. And if you go to the union of all, that's, that's kind of really hard. But to continue on the plug of open source and safe spaces, I would say the same, same thing we're trying to do with the Compliant Financial Infrastructure Project, which is we took a standard, which is the EDM Council standard for data in the cloud, mm -hmm. and we're trying to implement that standard in terms of code so that you can, uh, anyone who puts data in the cloud can evidence compliance with that standard. Now, that's a standard that a lot of companies came together and developed, not financial industry specific. And no, I, as far as I know, no one, no regulator has blessed it. 
and I also understand that a regular is not going to officially bless any standard. However, if you have a standard that many, many people are using and that begins a conversation, then a regulator might, might be able to be enabled to say, oh, look, you're missing this one thing, add it. Everybody adds it. And, and what's also nice about that is then you have the um, accounting firms using that standard as well to, because when you get your auditors, your external auditors coming in and auditing you against that and they can use this same standard, that's huge. That's a huge savings for everybody in terms of work and understanding starting that conversation. So I think if we, if we add it on top of it, like, like, you know, a, a menu or a code, like a codified sort of template of rules, and then maybe that's another way. Part of what I'm asking myself and the, the community is how do we bring the regulators to the table? How do we make it understood that open source is really a safe space for doing that? It takes very, it, there's no setup cost. There's no agreements that need to be made. Everybody just participates. Um, and maybe that's how we started. But I think the standard at the core of it is, is part of the solution, part of the answer. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you go back. Well, good point of the extending Jane's comments. I think, um, you know, we were talking about uh, from communication point of view earlier on, and Jane raised a really good point about, uh, you know, pretty much uh, something like we, I heard earlier this morning, which is policy as a code. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in order to kind of, you know, policy itself as a natural entity can be interpreted in different mm -hmm. ways, but code, you know, it can only be interpreted by machine the same way. Uh, I, I, what do you guys think? You know, for, you know, I think I heard the regulation of code part. Do you reckon that how can we make use of this technology or paradigm to kind of solve this issue? What do you reckon? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just start from, from where, we, where I'm at at the moment, um, but I'm, 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 I'm kind of open, and that, you know, that's why I'm here to learn. Um, you know, for me, natural language processing is probably a better place to start in terms of the kinds of problems that I'm seeing, um, the kinds of issues I care about, which are much more like, they're much more in the kind of stress testing situation. Like what's the, like what's the norm? What's the range? Where do I prioritize my action as a regulator? Like if I was doing it as a regulator, I think as a firm, right, you'd do that as well. You'd be like, okay, you know, how big's the problem? What's great? What's terrible? What's in the middle? Like, where, you know, where are my outliers? Th that, that seems to me a bigger priority um, in terms of getting ahead of some of the problems like I was talking about, like fraud or um, terms and conditions of products or firms coming into the market that aren't regulated and, you know, kind of um, defrauding people. That and, and, and when I talk to my partners on the ground, that seems to be the technology they would, you know, they, they would most like to, to use from a conduct perspective for the regulators. They just have tons of information. It's mostly written down. It's um, board papers, product, you know, papers in all sorts of unstructured, crazy places. And they just kind of want to get ahead of it, um, social media analysis. So that, that's where I'm at rather than codifying but that's a particular focus on emerging markets and a particular focus on consumer protection market conduct issues rather than transaction monitoring and you know, um, wholesale markets or whatever. So that, that's what I'm hearing and seeing from my perspective. Yes, on the, <clears throat> on the policy as code, I think the, like, the regulators need to be very clear minded about what uh, can be applied in this way and what cannot. To put it very simply, you know, it's the difference between principles-based regulation and, and rules-based regulation, right? So, so you only want to codify the one that are on the extreme uh, side of, of this, but principles-based regulation are here for a reason. You know, they are useful, um, and uh, and they need to uh, stay. But even in the context of principles-based regulation, you may have certain parts of it. For instance. Um, does this rule apply to me? You know, that could be in itself codified, even if the rule itself is, you know, remains principle-based. So I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's a matter of, you know, be, being clear about where you want to apply that. 
one obvious use case, which happens to be the, the one that we focus on, is whenever the regulators are looking to collect large amounts of data, and as much as possible, this data needs to be comparable between many, many firms. When you want to have that consistency, that's where you know policy as code makes a ton of sense because it's also self-interested from the regulator standpoint. You know, the more accurate the data they are going to collect, the more omniscient they are, they are going to be about it. So, so I think that's you know definitely a, a you know an area of application of that, but not all of it is. I, I just want to say from, from a regulator's position, when it comes to the actions that a regulator takes, and um, it's, ve it's very rarely based on rules. It's, it's much more around the general principles. Now, that could be a point in time aspect of market conduct regulation, but, but you know, the, 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 the rule breaking can be... I guess indicators, you know, they can be kind of a way of assessing it, but 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 generally, it's a it's a principle based thing that certainly in the UK perspective that ha as are the issues that they go after most, um, the most serious ones. So I I, I totally agree with your perspective, and I think it's a really important framework for us to think to. And I really love the link between it could be principles based, but there could be um, does it apply to me or not, like a binary yes or no. But I think in terms of where executive committees make decisions, it's 90% of the time from, from a principles-based point. Yeah, we have a project for that too. <laughs> Sweet. We're, we're, we're really, we're trying, so <laughs> less so specifically on emerging markets. So the, the um, effort that we started with Jennifer, for example, around uh, digital currencies, that's, that's one place where we're really trying. We, another place where we've started and haven't done enough yet, but we should do more is, for example, Mojulu Foundation is, is part, is, is an associate member of ours. So definitely... So when I talk about the, our Reg Innovation Special Interest Group, um, in general, what, how we position our SIGs versus projects is the SIGs deal with sort of the problem space, discussing what people want to do, what are the problems people want, want to solve, and then convert them into projects. So, and that's the most exciting part because then you create a collaboration on something very specific. So. We have the tools. We don't always get to everything because we're a very small team, but, but it is this community. If you come to the Reg SIG and you raise these issues and, and you have like-minded peers, it doesn't take very many to start a project or even to do an exploration. And one of the things, so for example, Leo and, and some other, and the Morgan Stanley team just did a hackathon on something. So you could do it in a, in a sort of trial way very quickly. Um, and, and see what happens, or, or even narrow down the idea to something very specific. So we have tools for that, and I, I have to say, I, I wish we would do more, so come and, and, and tell everybody what you, what you think we should do. And I guess David, um, who's the co-founder from AIR, um, they are looking at emerging markets as well, so one of the co-founders of your group. Yeah, um, he has brought, got a focus. The, he co-leads the SIG, actually. Yeah. Yep. So, so there is, you know, there, there are a specific interests, and, and, and 
he has links to other things. So I, I think it's great advice and good opportunities. Um, I don't know if this is value add, but just to pick up on what Jane said around the Open Digital Currency Initiative, I do think where we are right now in this moment of time and being able to rethink the structure of money and the end users of money, the infrastructure that moves money, there's a space that has not been created before for um, uh, emerged markets, as developed markets to learn from emerging markets. There is a massive amount of innovation, to your point, that's happening and is meeting the needs and removing barriers for citizens in a way that we haven't been able to unlock in the West. And it is a, an opportunity to learn um, in the very early design phases of this, this future ecosystem. So it's, it's a specific use case, but I think it's a valuable one that will elevate emerging markets perspectives and the knowledge and expertise that they can bring to the conversation for the West. Maybe just to, yeah, I have one minute uh, as, as indicated. No, I, I just wanted to uh, to talk about another thing, which is like the, the sandbox idea. Uh, a lot of regulators around the globe have, have started, you know, sandbox initiatives where effectively, and a lot of those are in emerging markets because they realize, you know, the gap between the need to uh, gap uh, to bridge uh, financial inclusion versus the fact that their own markets were not, you know, as developed. Um, and I think like do, a lot of those ideas are being tested uh, out of that. So I think it creates that space for collaboration between the fintechs and the, the, the regulators. Uh, so, you know, uh, one way to encourage that is to take, you know, success stories of, you know, sandbox being realized in certain countries um, and, you know, trying to um, encourage or nudge the, the regulators in others to adopt similar approaches. And that's where I think Finos can play a role as well in, in promoting that. Yeah, and actually, our third partner, uh, Daniela, who's uh, executive director of the Hyperledger Foundation, and she could make it here, uh, but, but she would have been on this panel as well and talking exactly about that. Hyperledger spends a lot of time working with and talking to different parts of different governments in different countries and helping them experiment with uh, blockchain technology and and then you know, kind of what we're trying to do is bring all the pieces together. And that's why we started this digital currency initiative is to pull together all of this information. And, and our hope, our next step hope is to, to again, have round table kind of conversations, bring participants together and say, right, so what would you like to learn? Would you like to do an experimentation case, just elevate your knowledge, or would you like to try something out and, and bring in different, uh, players um, to work on that. I'll do, just do one quick plug, um, before, I guess, before we close. But the Atlantic Council has a CBDC tracker that you can, uh, it's brilliant, actually. It's probably the most comprehensive one I've seen. Um, and you can sort by technologies. And, and I bring it up because I think it was Karen um, with Hyperledger who pointed out that three out of the seven um, technologies that have been chosen globally are Hyperledger-based technologies. So if you want to go a little bit down a rabbit hole and see who is using open source globally as they're thinking about central bank digital currencies, um, how that pairs with what type of economy they are, um, et cetera, it's a, it's a wonderful resource. Um, so it's the CBDC tracker with the Atlantic Council. So we were given the sign that we're out of time. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and engaging with us. And, and please do visit all the resources that we mentioned. And we'd love to see you participate and voice your opinions. Thank you. Thank you.